So today we're going to be talking about chapter 6, section 2, called the Roman Empire. And we're going to be talking about how the Roman Empire transformed um, from a, a republic, that is a representative form of government, um, to this empire, meaning centralized control from a non-elected figure. And then what effect that had on the common people, uh, what effect that had on the way business was conducted, and even the way that people lived. So, first off, how did this happen? You know, you take one of the most advanced civilizations of the ancient world um, and begin to pick it apart, well, it collapsed. You know, what's left of Rome? Well, there's a city, there's now the country of Italy, but what's left of the Roman Empire? Well, there's a cultural legacy where they were once politically and militarily dominant, now all we have left of them is the influence they've given us. So why? Well, we actually copied their form of government, which is why our story parallels theirs so closely. But then theirs collapsed. So why? Well, one of the first reasons is a severe income gap, income inequality to a scary level. The rich were very rich, the poor were very poor, and the, they were both trending that way. So as years went by, the gap grew greater. Yes, ma'am? If they failed and like kind of like fell, then why would we copy them? Well, the Republican form of government is a great system. You know, it's, it's what we've set up. But what we also had to think about was how do we set up that system in a way that we don't repeat these mistakes. And so that's where it's helpful to see, well, what did go wrong? So income gap will destroy any civilization, no matter how good the government. If people can't eat, they won't listen to a government. They will start killing people. Um, what else? When the middle class, your normal people, can't make ends meet that's when things get desperate too. So, you know, it's one thing if you're thinking about, well, they're homeless because of uh, mental health, because of these complications, because of these issues. We have systems in place to help them. But when you're thinking like, no, this is a normal person, <laughs> you know, teacher, doctor, lawyer, uh, mechanic, construction, carpenter, and when those folks can't make ends meet, that's strike two. That's when things are getting really scary. So what else? Well, you know, even in the midst of those two major problems, a lot of Romans still believed in the system, saying, look, this is the greatest civilization ever. I mean, hey, we got some pretty good things going for us. If it's a representative government, let's get some representatives to make these problems public to begin to advocate for us because that's what representatives are supposed to do. So they get a couple of tribunes. The purpose of tribunes were to be representatives of the poor. The two tribunes were Tiberius and Gaius. And they started speaking out about this. You know, they were kind of the, the Bernie Sanders of their day saying, talk about, you know, wealth inequality, you know, talking about how it's a hard living for a normal person trying to make an honest way in the world. Poor Tiberius and Gaius. Are they both boys? Yes. They yeah. Boys. They were both murdered. Excuse me, what? Oh, they were murdered? Yeah. Is that, wait, is that what the Hunger Games came from? Is tribute, tribute? A tribute or a tribune? It's a very similar thing, yeah. So the tributes were chosen to represent the common people of their district. So the tribunes are chosen to represent the common people of Rome. And so the representatives of the common people are being murdered. So this is, I mean, again, like, there are some parallels here, but things are getting pretty scary in Rome. Maybe not as scary as, you know, we're not there yet. However, we were there in 1860. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Yes, sound familiar? It's a Gettysburg Address. So when we were engaged in a great civil war, 
testing whether this nation or any nation so conceived in liberty can long endure. What that really means is, oh my gosh, we've hit Rome level. Half a million people died in America in the 1860s as a result of the Civil War. So this is where Rome was. And it was a real crucial moment in American history when we hit this point. Because when the Civil War broke out in Rome, well, here's the rest of the story. The military became less disciplined, were loyal to particular generals instead of to the nation as a whole. And uh, soldiers were being recruited and were joining the military purely out of income, not necessarily loyal to any larger country, but really just to the, a, a particular general. So what happens when a country becomes unstable? Someone will rise up and promise stability. Someone will play on the fears of the common person. Isn't that what Hitler did, though? Absolutely. Yeah, it's what Hitler did. It's what Mussolini did. It's what Francisco Franco did. It's what so many have done through history. It's to promise to fix things. And when people are scared, they're willing to listen to a strong person who says, come with me if you want to live. It's human nature. We feel scared. You know, just those first couple things alone are enough to make people feel scared. And then a civil war is going on. And here you have this famous general returning from great victories. Julius Caesar marches into Rome with his army. What does he do? He fixes the civil war. He stops it. How did people react? They loved him. They loved him. He was incredibly popular. We'll get to that. They kill him eventually. But yeah, they they loved him. He was so popular. He fixed the civil war. He promised to fix the problems of income inequality and to help the middle class get back on track. And of course, there were two different leaders of Rome because you have two of these consuls. You know, one controls the military, one controls civil matters. Now, Pompey, the consul who was in control of the military, was concerned. You know, Julius Caesar fixed everything. Yay! You know, he's incredibly popular, but Pompey, this, uh, you know, elected figure, is concerned. He's like, what's going to happen when Caesar says, you know what? I fixed the Civil War. How about I fix everything else? And people, guess what, are going to go, yeah, yeah. You can fix everything? Let's do that. Well, what do you need to do to fix everything? I need total control. Give me total control, and I can fix everything. And people will do it. And people did do it. What did they do when Caesar promised to fix everything? He needed the control he needed. They gave it to him. So Pompey saw the writing on the wall. And he, along with his armies challenged Caesar, saying, what you are doing is unlawful. You can't just take over like this. You can't just assume power. Well, Caesar had the loyalty of his armies. Well, Pompey had the loyalty of their armies. And so it led to a second civil war. But Julius Caesar emerged the victor, and he was crowned dictator for life, 44 BCE. Caesar was risk. I'll skip the clips for time's sake. Uh, we can watch them later. Caesar.
fix the Civil War, though? Did he literally just kind of walk out there and was like, hey, stop? So it was... It, it, it was, yeah, he just... He, the simple answer is he marched in with the army. And, you know, you have the civil unrest, you have these wealthy, powerful figures playing the common people off of each other, and, you know, things were just in utter chaos. And then he marches in with his army that no one's really capable of stopping, and he puts soldiers on street corners and says, okay, there's civil unrest, there's rioting, there's burning, there's looting, people are killing each other. Um, they won't do it when I put soldiers on street corners and impose martial law and impose curfew and have soldiers watching to make sure people behave. That sounds like freaking Hunger Games. It, 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 I'm telling you, that story has been copied in so many popular works because it's a really scary story of how we are so willing to throw away freedom for the purpose of safety. Because we just are. And so he promised to fix everything. Well, what did he do? Well, he actually kind of did. You know, that's the scary thing. These dictators aren't just evil figures going, Mwahaha. you know, often they do believe in their heart that they want to fix these things. You know, for example, it was once said of Mussolini, who was the dictator of Italy far later in the 1930s. People said, well, he got the trains running. I've got a job. There's stability. They're talking about a dictator. But what people were really concerned about was, well, I have a job. Things are going fine. So what if he's a dictator? It works. That's the scary thing is sometimes, well, let's see where it goes wrong. So he fixes a lot of these things. He even extends citizenship to many of these conquered places, expands Rome creates jobs for the poor. But he was rendering the Senate, the lawmaking body, obsolete because he was making the rules himself. So the Senate staged a trap for him. They invited Caesar to the forum to debate a number of his policies. And so he came to meet with the Senate. And they all stabbed him. Every single one of them stabbed him. Yes, that's now, freaking cool. Do you have a yeah. video of this? Oh, I mean, there's tons of movies of this. Shakespeare even wrote a play on it. Um, now, speaking of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, uh, it has some of the most famous pieces of this. You know, you've probably heard of Friends Roman Countrymen, Lend Me Your Ears. That was the speech that Caesar's best friend gave at his funeral. Okay. So anyway, okay. Caesar's former best friend... Uh, Brutus had served with him in the military, had fought countless battles, had saved his life so many times, had gone on to a career in the Senate, and had also been concerned about Caesar's growing popularity and power. And his best friend was the last to stab him. And Caesar's, That's so freaking cool! Caesar's last words when he looked his friend in the eye, the one person who held him and stabbed him to the face. Well, stabbed him face to face. He said, et tu brute. What? Which is Latin for, you too, Brutus. Oh, that's so sad. Be oh, that's kind of fun. I would cry. Killed by his own too. best friend. Dude, that's like if just Stella just kind of came up to me and stabbed me. I was like, you too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> et tu brute. I mean, and so it's such a famous story that, you know, these things have just made their way into our popular language. So, et tu brute is a way of saying, you've betrayed me. And, you know. <laughs> what happens when you assassinate a dictator? Well, bad things tend to happen because you've created further instability. So, here's Caesar being stabbed by everybody. Uh, again, this occurred roughly 44 BCE. Now, what happened after this? Well, you know, according to Shakespeare, Caesar's current best friend got up and gave a, a brilliant speech at his funeral, really rallying people behind the idea that what Caesar was doing was working. And what we needed was not a return to the corrupt republic, 
But what we needed was another strong figure. And so Octavian, which is literally translated to the number eight. Romans named their children numbers. Idiots. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a fun thing. But anyway, yeah. Go ahead. I did this kid in middle school. His name was seven. Yeah. Really? I mean, 11's one of... 11's one of my favorite characters from Stranger Things, and she's just named Eleven. So, yeah. New season comes out this year. So excited. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, anyway, back to the story, because I do want to finish before we run out of time. Uh, Mr. Number Eight, uh, Caesar's best friend, Mark Antony, and their ally, Lepidus, uh, join and, 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 and try to fix things. Uh, but... The problem is, not all of these folks get along. Now, you remember at the beginning of the chapter, Cleopatra had a thing with Julius Caesar. Well, guess what? Caesar's dead. Now his best friend goes knocking on her door. And so Mark Antony and Cleopatra join up and try to stop Octavian, who will later begin to call himself Augustus, which means exalted one. Way better name than number eight. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a mess. But here's Augustus, the first of these new Roman emperors. Um, so this is really the beginning of the Roman Empire. So, again, the irony here, and, and Plato really speaks to this in his book, The Republic, is that dictators done well... Can get things done and where plato had the problem with democracy is the very same thing you guys were talking about with group work is that making decisions as a group can be chaotic but plato believed that if there was a wise enlightened philosopher king that was the ideal form of government according to plato but the problem is well it doesn't hold up because before you know it caesar was trying to take over everything Augustus wasn't very much different, though. He was a very effective ruler, but he thought of himself as a god. Power no longer resided with any form of representative republic, but it's now centralized in a single ruler. But nonetheless, Rome enjoyed 200 years of peace. It was a time known as the Pax Romana, which just means the peace of Rome. Augustus was considered Rome's most capable ruler in all of their history. It was a time when the Romans built some of the most beautiful public buildings, the aqueducts, the roads, the structures. He set up a very effective civil service, meaning you know, that, that's folks who work for the government, like teachers, uh, police, fire, etc., um, to administer the empire. Yeah, so if you work, if the taxpayer pays your bill, pays your salary, then you work for the government, you are part of what's called the civil service. Um, so not only did Augustus effectively manage the empire, um, he established a common currency called the denarii, um, a, a vast trading network as far as China, and, and built, and, and some of you guys mentioned communication, um, he built an elaborate network of roads that linked the empire to Persia, to Russia, to Europe. And what that allowed for is efficient travel. And when people can travel all over the place, they can engage in commerce. And the wider the commerce is, the wealthier it is. So Rome was doing quite well under these emperors. So, for example, trade in the Roman Empire at their height, they were bringing goods as far as Great Britain and as far east as Babylon. And as far east even further as China. The Silk Road is something we'll talk about in a different time. Here's the Roman centralized currency. Notice that it has the figure of Caesar. And so he wanted, Augustus wanted his face to be seen everywhere. He wanted images and symbols of him to be seen everywhere. And so, you know, think of the Hunger Games, how there are just images of snow everywhere. Uh, it's, 
it's really similar to what you're seeing here. So slavery was a significant part of the Roman world, even when they were a republic. Um, many of these slaves were captives captured in battle, folks who owed large sums of money, and, and most worked on farms. Um, but a really neat story about the Romans, and you've probably heard of this, is that some of these slaves became gladiators and became professional fighters, forced to fight to the death. Not always, though. And there's some neat stories about the gladiators. They didn't always fight to the death. Sometimes they would fight to submission, and then the crowd would choose to let them live. Um, Roman religion is similar to the Greeks, um, but the gods each have different names. And some of these, like Jupiter, uh, are now the planet Jupiter. So a lot of these, the names of the Roman gods have made their way into our language. You ever wondered why July is called July? Julius Caesar. Is that why October is October? Because Octavius. Why yeah. Augustus for August? Mm hmm. Augustus Luke? Yeah, so. And then this is So the Romans were polytheists. They believed in many different gods. But one god that the Romans insisted upon until Constantine was the worship of the emperor. They believed that the emperor was both God and king. So, speaking of the gladiators, I have some fun clips I'll show you after the lesson. But um, the gladiators fought in the arena, and they were um, the NFL of their time. Now, the Roman world. The rich lived incredibly well, though most people were poor. I mean, Caesar did some to fix the income inequality, uh, but he didn't level society. This is not communism. Uh, you know, there was still an income gap. Um, so if there's still the income gap and people are still desperately poor, well, what do they do? And bring in the Hunger Games. If you've read the books, you'll catch this reference to bread and circus. Peter. Bread and circus. So... What uh, again? You gotta you gotta catch it. I don't think they mention it in the movies, but in the books they talk about bread and circus being the perfect distraction. So what they would do is they had programs to give food to the poor, but they also hosted tons of public events, spectacle, and entertainment. And so the gladiators served an important political purpose because by distracting people with games, they were rooting more for the guy that was going to kill each other in the arena and the guy who was than, going to kill them. than any type of revolution. It was what? distracting. Is that what, uh, like, in nowadays, is that what, like, Big Brother and Survivor is? Uh, like a like an almost modern-day gladiator? I mean, kind of, except these guys were killing each other. I know, but, like, yeah. yeah, modern. Yeah, yeah, kind of like you're rooting for, here's some real stakes and so forth. Um, okay, so... Yeah, here's some images of the arena, and again, I have some clips for this. I'll play you later. Um, so, that's it for now.
Just now, why you were here? 